All right. Good morning, lads and ladies. Thank you for being patient for me this morning. Yeah, that, <clears throat> I imagine if you're in Gainesville, you're aware it's quite rainy outside. And getting my son into this uh, daycare was a little more challenging. Than but today is going to be a fun day for us because today we are going to introduce the last big family of functions that we're going to study in this class. It's kind of us rounding the corner and coming into this last set of hurdles before the end of the race. So we can um, breathe easy in a sense. That after you meet these guys today, there are no more weird or scary characters in the course, right? We've met kind of all of the, all the players. Um, maybe a little bit uneasy in the sense that these guys that we saved for last are kind of the hardest to wrap your head around because there's no nice way to define them through algebra formulas that we're familiar with. We have to define them as the inverses of other functions. Um, so the, the name of these critters is the logarithm and um, that's what we're going to introduce today. I did want to kind of take a, a little poll or a survey um, because I haven't had time to check this morning, but I'd like to see <laughs> well, let's go ahead and do that. It's a title card, and then we'll do that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, and actually, Tyson, the, the poll I want to take is related to that. So let's go ahead and do this. This is Math 1105, Math 1105, Section 015, which is College Algebra. And the date today is the 24th, March 2022. Today, as I mentioned, I want to introduce logarithms. Um, but first, I want to take a, a little poll to see how you guys are doing with the homework set. So let me. I'm working with 16 that we're on right now, right? <clears throat> yeah, exponentials part two. Uh, and this is just no. So I know that we've moved kind of quickly through the exponential material. Um, and I, I'd just like to get a feel for where you're at with the homework and quiz. Um, completion rates are one thing, but it's nice to see what you guys feel yourselves. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's pretty decisive. Looks like everybody is in is in this situation. Okay. Yeah, there are some problems in there that are a little bit tricky. We have to think quite carefully. So that is, I think, everybody. So far, I got thirteen out of eighteen. 14 out of 18. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and assume that everybody wants a little bit more time on that material. So before we get into the, I know, that's not everybody wanted it. No, it's not. So before we get into the logarithm stuff, Little more on exponentials. If I had to guess, I'd say that there are some um, some concepts that we've discussed that we haven't worked with enough through examples in class, and that's that's perhaps where the the challenge and problem number twenty is coming from. And then there are also some concepts from previous classes that we might want to revisit and try to become a little bit more uh, reacquainted with in the context of the work we're doing now. So let me go ahead and pull up homework sixteen. Um, it looks like um, number twenty is in. High demand, and we can take a look at a few others there too, like 11 and 22. Oh. Okay. So number 11, we're told that we have 300 grams of some unknown radioactive substance that's decaying according to this function. E, you remember, is that Euler's number, that 2.7-ish number. Um, and 
So this is an exponential function that tells you how quickly the radioactive substance is decaying, how quickly it's going away. <clears throat> they say T is measured in years, and they ask how long before half of the original amount is gone. So we write down this function. This is over 16, over 20. So a substance decays according to the function d of t equals 300 e to the negative 0 0.001635 t. And I want to know how long until half of the original amount remains. So <clears throat> uh, there's sort of two parts to this. The first little bit requires a, a smidge of interpretation. Uh, they want to know how long until half of the substance remains. Well, in order to know how much that is, I have to know how much we're starting with. So how much of this stuff did we start with? Yeah, we're starting with 300, and I think we're probably measuring this in grams, right? Yeah. So we start with 300. So half remaining because we have 150 grams, right? So then what we need to do, this is kind of like the last example we did on Tuesday. We need to solve the equation d of t equals 150, where d of t is this function here. And because at this point we don't have logarithms, the only approach which will work is <clears throat> is going to be a, a graphical approach. So let me go ahead and plug in this function for d of t. That's 300 times e to the negative 0 0.001635 t equals 150. Everybody comfortable with how we know to set up this equation? This is the function that tells me how much I have left after t years. I want to know when will I have 150 grams left. So I set the amount left after t years equal to 150. And then I'm going to try to solve for t. Now there is a little bit of stuff we can do here. I could divide both sides by 300. That's an option. Hundred and fifty divided by three hundred is one half. And then this equation, once we know a little bit about logarithms, we will be able to solve this equation by hand. It's going to require a new operation called taking the natural log of both sides. Um, it's kind of like taking the square root of both sides or squaring both sides. But we'll involve that new function. Because we don't yet know about logarithms, we have to attack it graphically. So we can use our calculator here. I'll turn this on. I'm going to type in this function, e raised to the negative, blah, 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 blah. Remember, the e button here is, you see this little e? So we hit second and then divide to get the e. And we want to raise that to the power of negative 0 0.001635. We have to use the variable x in the calculator. And then the other thing I'm going to enter down here is the, the right hand side, one half. So just like we did in, in class on Tuesday, you enter this for y1 and this for y2, and we're looking for the intersection point. 
So here I have that exponential, the left-hand side, up here in y1. I have the right-hand side, it's the constant one-half in y2. I can hit graph. And odds are I won't be able to see much because of the window settings here. This exponential is decaying very slowly. So on this scale, I got nothing. Remember that exponentials are always positive. So my y min, I can set that to like zero or negative one without any harm. I'm trying to figure out where this thing is equal to positive one half, which is a pretty small number, way smaller than 10. So let me change the y max to like five or maybe even like four, because I, I want to be able to discern numbers of the size one half-ish on the y axis. Um, X values, I'm not really interested in negative values for the time here, so I'll just make that one. And let me jump this up to like 100, because this exponential is going to decay very, very slowly, because this power is very, very small. So now when we draw a graph, hopefully we can see a little bit more what's going on. Still incredibly slow decay. And you see that if these two are going to hit, it's going to be somewhere way off to the right. So let's, let's open this up, like negative 100 to 1,000 or something like that. You can see a little better. Ah, that's looking a little better, right? Now we have a better picture of the graph. Oh, and there you see the intersection point, right? Where those two lines hit. That's what we're looking for. We're trying to find the x value where those two curves cross. So I can bring up my trace function and start trying to get a rough idea. Let's see here, I'm looking for y being exactly 0 0.5. So somewhere between these guys, somewhere between 414 and 426, we're gonna have this change. Now, if we wanna get a little more granule, if we wanna be more precise, remember what we did last time, we can bring up the table. Oops, second. Right. Where about, let me see, where about was that? There's like 400, right? Yeah, so let's go to 400. So we'll go to second window to bring up table settings. I want to start the table values at like 425, and we'll go up by one. We've got a, a good idea. All right, so we're looking for the co column Y1 to be exactly 0 0.5. Between 423 and 424, that's going to be the sweet spot. Right? So if we're looking for a whole number, nearest whole number, 423 or 424, we can see what sort of precision they're asking for. They ask <clears throat> round to one decimal place. So to get that level of precision, I'm going to go back to my table settings window, table set. We can start at 422. But instead of taking a step up of one each time, let's take a step up of 0 0.1. back to our table. And again, we're looking for the y value being exactly 0 0.5, as close to that as we can get. Oh, we're going bigger now, sorry. 0 0.503, 502, 501. All right, so. Looks like 423.9 is gonna be the one that gets us closest here. Very good, right? Graphically. Or from the table. Yeah is approximately 423.1. Now we will have the ability to solve these <clears throat> better, right? More exactly um, soon. But the purpose of these problems is to, to get you to a place where you're comfortable setting up and understanding these equations and to practice a little bit working with the graphing calculator and the table function. So don't be shy about doing it. Questions on how we solve Oh, sorry, this is number 11, not number 20. Questions on homework 16, number 11?
Okay, let's take a look at number 20 next then. Oh, so for each nominal exponential growth of decay described below, find the effective annual growth rate and express it as a percentage rounded to one decimal place. So here we're looking for growth rates, right? And that was that thing that we defined last time. There are a few things in here. Each one is described using kind of different terminology. And I think one of these Ooh, yeah, one of these, the second one, where they're talking about shrinking at a continuous rate. I thought we had pulled these out, so I'll have to define that for you guys. I'm sorry. Let's do this. So find this is 16, number 20. We want to find the growth rate. For each part A. We're told that this quantity is modeled by the function a of t equals 1.07 to t in part b. We're told that this is a quantity shrinking with the continuous rate. Yeah, the College Algebra, the Mac 11 05 committee had a big argument about whether or not to keep this stuff in the course. And we decided not to, but it looks like they didn't pull it 31% per year. Let's see, 25%. with a tripling time of eight years. So this is for the most part a good question. <clears throat> in each case, we're just trying to find the growth rate. That's the number little r that we introduced in class on Tuesday. So remember the growth rate. This is what you get when you write your function in the form, something like f of x equals c times 1 plus r to the x. r is the growth rate. And when people ask for an effective annual interest rate, it's the same thing as a growth rate. Let's start with part a here. I'm given the function a of t equals 1.07 to the t. I want to kind of try to understand that as a function like this. Let's say of all of these, this is the most straightforward. So I can write 1.07 as 1 plus 0 0.07. So this is 1 plus 0 0.07 to the t. So r is 0 0.07, which is 7%. So that is our growth rate here. The continuous rate business. Now, this is something that, like I said, I, I haven't defined for you guys, and this is my fault. So let me let me come down here really quickly and define this. It's another one of those special exponential formulas. So if you have a quantity initially measuring C that grows or decays at the continuous rate R, then this is modeled by f of x equals C times e to the Rx. Here you'll see sometimes e to the Rt, 
times DTPRT. You can use different labels for these things. The meaning behind continuous rate is that it's almost like continuously compounded interest. The idea is that at every moment in time, if you check in and ask what is the relative growth rate, it will come out to R. It's a calculus thing, and that's why it really doesn't belong in this class. Um, but for whatever reason, they've, they've decided to leave it in the homework set. So what we need to do is use this function and then try to rewrite it in a form where we can see what the regular growth rate is. So we're told that we're shrinking with a continuous rate of 31% per year. Um, that means that this R, this R is going to be negative 31% or negative 0.31. So the function here, we don't know what the original amount of the quantity is, so I'll just leave it as C. But then since we are shrinking at the continuous rate of 31%, this would be negative 0.31 times X. And the idea again is that if you were to find the instantaneous rate of change for this function, it would be R times that function. That's where the term continuous rate comes from. But for now, just think of it as, as a clue, right? When you see continuous rate, you know we got to use this recipe. The challenge is now to find the, the regular growth rate for this function, right? To write this function in the form C times one plus R to the X. This is, for all of these problems, this is the key. A little bit of algebra can help us out here e to the something times x is the same as e to that something all raised to the x. This is one of our rules for exponents, right? That a to the b times c is the same as a to the b all to the power c. That algebra rule. That if you have some number a raised to a power b times c, that's the same as taking a to the b and raising that whole thing to the power c. So e to the negative 0 0.31 times x is the same as e to the negative 0 0.31 all raised to the x. The reason I want to do this is because this number here is going to be my 1 plus r. Right, you see c times da 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 to the x, c times da 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 to the x. So if I can then find this number, let's get under the table, second e raised to the negative 0 0.31, that's 0 0.733. C times 0 0.733 to the x. And then the question is, this is 1 plus what? How do I write 0 0.733 as 1 plus something? Well, this is like, you know, uh, 0.27 less than 1, right? So you can subtract this from 1. You get this, yeah, 0 0.26. So this is the same as, I'll bring it over here. This is the same as C times 1 minus 0 0.266. I guess if we're rounding 267 to the x. So here, R is negative 0 0.267 or 26.7%.
And so that growth rate is negative because we are decaying or shrinking. Everybody follow these steps. To go from here to here, I just subtracted one from this. That gave me this 0 0.267. And I realized, oh, well, this thing is the same as 1 minus 0 0.267. So my growth rate is that negative 0 0.267. And they get the percent, you're multiplying that number, the 0 0.267 by 100, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah, you can think of it as multiplying by 100 or skipping the decimal point over two. I think for the rest of these, I'll move on to a separate sheet. I don't want to clutter this anymore. It's getting a little bit, a little bit crowded here. Other questions on part B then? So here, if I have um, some quantity that is growing at a rate of 25% compounded monthly, here we have to use that um, compound interest formula, right? It's P times one plus R over N raised to the NT. So they told us that the rate here, the compound interest rate is 25% and that we're compounding monthly. Remember in this formula, P is the Principal R is the interest rate. N is the weird one. This is the number of compoundings per unit time, which is usually per year. Because usually in these contexts, we measure time in years. And T is the time, usually in years. So just like the last one, they didn't tell me the initial amount, but that doesn't matter because we're just trying to find the growth rate. So here they didn't tell me the principal P, but they told me all the stuff I need to structure this thing. So A of T here would be P times one plus 0 0.25, that's that 25% written as a decimal, divided by N. We're compounding monthly here, and we're measuring time in years. So that means every year we're compounding 12 times. So N is 12 raised to the N, which is 12 times T. So here R is 25% or 0 0.25. And is 12. That's what uh, from here, it's very similar to the last problem. I want to write this in the form one constant times some other constant to my variable. I have this 12 out here, which is making things a little bit weird. So first, let me go ahead and compute the inner part there. No harm in that. I'll take one plus. 0 0.25 divided by 12. That's 1.02, blah, blah, blah. 0, 0.83 raised to the 12t. And then I have to use this red rule again over here. I have to use this fact that this thing raised to the 12 times t is the same as that number to the 12, all to the t. And I think it's this particular algebra step where most people run into trouble. Right? It's the red rule over there, um, or a, a, a lack of familiarity or comfort with that red rule that, that gets people into trouble. So going from here to here, are we all comfy? Any questions about that or why we need to do that?
remember to figure out the growth rate, we need to write our function in this form. Just some constant times some other stuff raised to the x. So I have to get rid of that 12. To get rid of this 12, I have to have my power just being the variable x or t or whatever. And this is the way we do it. So now if I take that number and raise it to the 12th power, I get 1.28. Zero seven three ish t, and that of course is one plus zero point two eight zero seven three to the t. So this number is r. That would be twenty eight point zero seven three percent. That's the vibe. Another name for this growth rate is the effective interest rate, right? Growth rate and effective interest rate are the same thing. Questions on the solution for part C? Let's try part D. So, part D, we're told we've got some quantity with a half life of seven years. We know that that half-life formula, C times one half to the X over K, where K is the half-life. So this is going to be C times one half to the X over seven. And again, my goal is to write this as some constant times some other constant to the X. That base is what's going to tell me my growth rate. The problem here is that instead of having just an x, I have x over 7. So it's the same sort of problem that we had in the last one, where the power wasn't just the variable. It was like 12t. Here, the power isn't just the variable. It's like x over 7. So I need to get rid of this 7 and have the power just being the x. Then I can read off my growth rate. And the, the thing that saves the day is that same algebra rule. Uh, let me, let's see, so let me make a quick observation here. X over seven is the same as one seventh times X. So this is the same as two to the one seventh, I'm sorry, one half to the one seventh, all to the X like this. One half to the this times this is one half to the one seventh all to the x. And then I can compute one half to the seven. Uh, one half raised to the power of one divided by seven. It's the seventh root of one half. It's 0 0.9 c times 0 0.9057 all to the x. And then now we've done a few of these together. Somebody tell me, how do I find the growth or decay rate here? Now we've done all this algebra. What, what's the last bit of work we need to do? You'll subtract 0 0.9075 and times 7 to 1. Yeah, I can take one from this and I get negative 0 0.0942, blah, 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 blah. So this is the same as C times one minus 0 0.09428, say. So now R is this number. 
it's negative. And if you skip that decimal over, you see this is about negative 9.428%. So I'd say this is decaying at about 9.4% per year. Pretty cool, right? So you can go from one understanding of these things to the other. If you have half-life, you can figure out a growth rate. If you have a growth rate, you can figure out a half-life. And you can play that game for any of these systems. <clears throat> the last one here is a tripling time problem. And this one requires a bit, of, a bit of critical thinking because we have a doubling time formula. We don't have a tripling time formula. But if you think about it a little bit, the only difference between a doubling time thing and a tripling time thing would be the base. Part E. If you take your doubling time formula and you just replace that two with a three, that will give you a tripling time formula, right? So if you remember the doubling time formula had a two here. And we said the reason that works as doubling time is every time X goes up by K, this power goes up by one. Every time this power goes up by one, we multiply by two. Well, here, every time that power goes up by one, we're going to multiply by three. And they told us here that the time to triple for this guy is eight years. So this would be three to the x over eight. And then I'm going to follow the same sequence of steps we just did with our half life thing. This is going to be three to the one eighth to the x. I can take the eighth root of three raised to the power of <clears throat> one eight. It's 1.1472 C times 1.1472 to the x. And so that is 1 plus 0 0.1472 to the x. So R here, 0 0.1472 or 14.72%. These are fun problems. And I, I don't mind telling you that things of this nature have a tendency to show up on the final exam in this class where you're given an exponential function in one form, like as a half-life doubling time or you know, interest problem, and you're asked to find the growth rate or the growth factor. Everybody remembers what growth factors are, right? The growth rate here is this number, the 0.1472. The growth factor is just the base in this simplified version, the 1.1472. So it is not uncommon on the final exam in 1105 to see something like this. And with that in mind, is there anything that you guys would like to look at more carefully here? Yeah, I think there was, there was one other problem that was already requested. So let me do 22 and then we can move to number two. This is a bit of a tough one. So ask what interest rate compounded semi-annually and twice per year is equivalent to an effective interest rate of 5.57%. So remember, that the effective interest rate is the same as the growth rate. This and then we'll come back to number two. A lot of double letters, the semi-annually. Um, what interest rate compounded semi-annually is equivalent to 
an effective rate of 5.57%. <clears throat> so they're asking what sort of compound interest scheme will have a growth rate, right? Effective rate, growth rate, same thing of 5.57%. My first little note here would be to say recall that effective rate is the same as the growth rate. <clears throat> and then we have our compound interest formula. If we're compounding semi-annually, this means n is going to be equal to two. Semi-annually means twice per year, right? Or every half of year. So we're wondering, How do I get this thing to have an effective rate of 5.57%? So in other words, I'm wondering, how do I make the growth rate for this? So the question is, what value of R in this is the growth rate? of 5.57%. Uh, well, let's calculate the growth rate. So if I take this thing and I play the, the same sort of games we were doing a second ago, this is P times one plus R over two squared to the T. And I want this thing, right? This is the piece that would give me my growth rate. I want this thing to be uh, one plus this number, right? So this has an effective rate. Five seven percent if the inside here one plus r over two squared is equal to one plus this thing as a decimal zero point zero five five seven. That's the game. So this definitely requires a bit of critical thinking. It's not, not an obvious thing. Do you understand how we arrive at this equation? From here, it's going to be easy, but we got to make sure we're, we're comfortable with how we get here. Just All making right. sure if it would be asking for the decay rate instead of the one plus the point oh five five seven, it would be minus, right? That's correct. Yeah, if I wanted to make this thing decay with a rate of five point five seven percent, then I would set it up the same way, just with a minus here instead. That's a nice question. Other questions on this so far? Okay, then how do I solve this equation? I want to solve for R. I 
I can definitely add these, right? This is 1.0557. How would I solve such a thing for the number r? I can take the square root on both sides. Normally when we take square roots, we get a plus and a minus here, but I know I'm just interested in the positive solution. I'm thinking of this as a growing interest rate. So let's go ahead and take that square root. I get one plus r over two equals 1.0275, sorry. And then I can subtract one. If I subtract one from both sides, I'll get R over two equals 0 0.0275. And then we can multiply both sides by two. One, multiply by two. And I get 0 0.0549, blah, blah, blah. Five point four nine percent. So if we're going to try and get the same effective rate of 5.57% from a compound interest system where we're compounding twice per year, semi-annually, then the interest rate in the compound interest system would have to be 5.49%, a little lower because compounding increases the rate at which things go. Pretty cool, right? Questions on this guy? Okay, the last one that was requested was number two. Let's take a quick peek at number two and then I'll sort of get you ready to talk about logarithms. It seems like we needed this time today to focus a little more on exponentials and that's fine, we're on schedule. So I say find a formula for the exponential passing through these points. Negative one comma two thirds and positive three comma fifty four. Two numbers may be a little different. So, where do I begin? Um, you have to find the plug in the x and the y in the equation y equals the constant times the b 
to the x. Good. Yeah, we got to start with something like this, right? Either f of x equals or y equals c times b to the x, our sort of standard exponential. And then, just like Tyson said, we're going to plug each of these points in. So this means when x is negative 1, y is 2 thirds. So we're going to get 2 thirds is equal to c times b to the negative 1. That gives us one equation. And plugging in this guy says when x is 3, y is 54. So I get 54 equals c times b to the positive 3. The challenge here is that there's two equations. And each equation has two variables. So I can't, I, like, I can't solve this for b. The answer would have c's in it. And I can't solve this for c. The answer would have b's in it. And the same thing is true with, with this. One popular way to handle this sort of situation is to solve for one of the variables in terms of the other and then plug that into the other equation. That's called substitution. And you may have seen that when you talk about systems of equations in high school. So one option. Solve one equation for either variable, say C, then plug that into the other equation. Like if I solve this first equation for c, I have 2 thirds c times b to the negative 1 is 1 over b. <clears throat> Oops, 2 thirds equals c times 1 over b. I can multiply both sides by b. Uh, 2 thirds b equals c. And if I plug that in for c and the other guy, I plug this into the other equation in place of c, all right, 2 thirds b, I get 54 equals 2 thirds b times b cubed. Now this only has one variable in it, b. Now I can solve that for b. Let's first clean it up a little bit. This is 54 equals 2 thirds times b times b cubed is b to the fourth. I can multiply both sides by 3 halves. No sense, no harm using the calculator here. So 54 times 3, 2, 81. 81 equals b to the 4. And then we can take the fourth root on both sides. The fourth root of 81 is 3. Then we could take this number, so we know b is 3, and plug it back in here to get c. We get 2 thirds times 3 equals c, because we just found that b is 3. 2 thirds times 3 is 2, so 2 is c. So b is 3, c is 2, which means our function is y equals 2 times 3 to the x. Now I call this option 1 because there is another option. You could, if you don't want to do all of this substituting, divide this whole equation by this whole equation or divide this whole equation by this whole equation. Very quickly, option two. We take 54 divided by 2 thirds equals 
CB cubed divided by CB to the negative one. And then when you clean this up, 54 divided by 2 thirds, that's 81. That's what we just did. Over here, the C's cancel, and you get B cubed divided by B to the negative 1. That's divided by 1 over B. And then flipping and multiplying by the 1 over B, you get 81 equals B to the 4. So 3 is equal to B. And then you take this and you plug it back into either one of those equations, and then again, you'll get C is 2. So 4 equals C times 3 cubed. 54 equals 27c, and dividing both sides by 27, you get 2 equals. I'm a fan of option 2 here. I think it's like quick and really clever. Um, but the more general approach is, is the first one. So if that's what you uh, prefer or that's what makes sense to you, don't, don't be shy. There's nothing wrong with the substitution approach. Okay. Yeah, sure. Here's option one. Uh, we got a request to look at problem seven as well. We can take a quick peek at that. I do want to introduce some new material today. So take a quick, quick question for, yeah. so once we find B, we would have to find, oh wait, never mind. So once you've got the, B, you can go back to either of these two original equations. And, and plug it in to find. Exactly. Yeah, I went back to this one because this one had already been solved for C. That's fine as well. quick peek at number seven, and then a little gentle introduction to logarithms. So they tell us the half-life for this guy is 18.72 days. The amount after t years is given by this. Oh, didn't we do this? I think we did this one in class last time. Um, so this is, you'd set this function equal to eight grams, right? You set this whole apparatus equal to eight and then solve graphically. Um, so take a look at the video from Tuesday for that. I suppose it won't, it won't hurt to take a quick second here. So number seven, I won't write it down, but we'll take a quick look. So they gave us this function for the amount after t years. And they told us they want to know when there's going to be eight grams left. So just like the very first problem we did here today, I'm going to come in here. And for y1, I will type that function 10 times parentheses 0 0.5. Uh, raised to the power of x divided by 18.72. And then down here, I just type 8, because I want to know when this function will be equal to 8. Probably have to play with our window settings. Yeah, definitely. Um, Change this back to like minus one, something reasonable. This has to be seven. Yeah. Right. So we're looking for the point where these two graphs touch, and you can start getting a feel using the trace function. So this tells me, yeah, it's going to be somewhere around here, right? Somewhere around. 5.9, and then you can get really granular in your table. Table settings. They're going to start at 
five and increase by one tenth. And you can hunt around here until you get something. It looks like it's around six, right? 5.9, six, six point one, somewhere right around there. All right. So I will extend the homework and quiz uh, 16 through to next Tuesday. Um, but I'm also going to open up the new homework for logarithms. I don't expect you to do much with the new homework for logarithms, but I want to kind of prime you, show you what these things are, and, um, and give you the opportunity to start playing with them. And then next week, we'll work in earnest with logarithms. So the logarithms ones isn't going to be due at 9.30 on Tuesday, or is it going to Correct. Yeah, I'll set that to be due next Thursday. I like to begin talking about logs with a question, right? How could we solve the equation two to the x equals three? Is there even a solution? How many solutions? Uh, and then, you know, can we write down Can we write down the solution nicely? Um, the answer to all three of these is yes. Uh, well, the answer to the first one and the third one are yes, and the answer to the second one is one. There's one solution. Thinking about the graph, y equals two to the x. That is a growing exponential. So that is a graph that looks like this. Horizontal asymptote y equals zero over there. This point is zero comma one. When x is equal to one, you know y is equal to two. When x is equal to two, you know that y is equal to four. And three, of course, is right here. So there's one comma two. There's two comma four. So the solution to the equation, two to the x equals three, is the x value right here. So it does exist. And looking at the graph, you know that this function is always increasing. It only gets bigger and bigger as you go this way. It only gets smaller and smaller as it goes this way. So this guy is never going to curve back around and hit this line again. So you can say that there's only one solution. And the question of can we write down the solution nicely, that's the challenging one. If we play the game with the calculator, like we were doing a second ago. Start at zero, increase by one ten. Then you see those outputs will get close to three. Oh, there it is. I already went past it right here. So between 1.5 and 1.6, right? We go from having output 2.82 to output 3.03. .03. So somewhere between 1.5 and 1.6 is the solution. Calculator. That is approximately 1.5. The challenge here is that we don't have any We have 
there's no algebra tool or step to get variables down out of the power. Or exponent. All right, so in the equation two to the x equals three, I want to solve for x, which means I need to do something that'll get this x down out of the exponent so I can solve for it. So I can't solve for it while it's trapped up here. That tool is going to be a logarithm. So this is where we define. the base B logarithm of X. We write LOG and then a little subscript B and then of X. This is defined to be the inverse of the base B exponential. In other words, if F of X is just B to the X, then F inverse of X, in the sense that we talked about inverse functions, is log base b of x. And over the coming week, we're going to study all sorts of properties of these logarithms. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't, it's not like a power or a square root or anything that we've seen before, polynomial, rational function. It's its own thing. And this log, it's like a box. It's very hard to get into or out of. Um, so what we need to do is come to understand the algebra properties of the log by thinking about algebra properties of the exponential and then how inverse functions are related to the original function. The first thing, you know that if you compose functions with their inverse, you should just get x. This was how we defined the concept of an inverse, right? If you do, if you start with x, do f to it, then do f inverse to that. These two should cancel each other out and just leave you with what you started with. Well, here what that means is that if you plug the exponential b to the x into the base b log, then what you should get out is just x. So these guys somehow cancel to just give you x. And composing in the other order, f of f inverse of x, we know this should also simplify to x from the definition of the inverse. This means that b raised to the power of the base b log of x is just going to come out to x. And this is one way to define the logarithm. but it's not the only way. This, however, is what's going to allow us to solve equations like this. So if you take the base two log on the left and the base two log on the right, then on the left-hand side, you'll have log base two of two to the x. That's just gonna simplify to x. On the right-hand side, you have the log base two of three. And that's a weird number. There's no clean, easy way to calculate it by hand, but it is the solution to this equation. We're going to come back to all of that. I want to give you one other characterization of the, the logarithm, and then I'll let you go.
if you say that the base b log of x is equal to y, this is the same thing as saying b to the y is equal to x. In other words, the base b log of x is the number to which you must raise b in order to get x. So these are the two sort of definitions, or characterizations of the logarithm that we're going to work with in this class. And I like the language version down here. This is just saying in words what this says in symbols. So I think of these two as being the same thing. We say the base b log of x is equal to y if and only if b to the y equals x. In other words, the number you get out from the logarithm is the power to which you must raise b in order to get the number inside the logarithm. For example, the base 2 log of 8 is equal to 3, because 2 to the 3 is equal to 8. The base 3 log of 1 ninth is negative 2. because three to the negative two is one ninth. The base pi log of one. I have to ask myself to what power must I raise pi in order to get one? Well, that's gonna be zero because pi to the zero is equal to one. So starting on Tuesday of next week, we're going to do lots of practice with this sort of stuff where you're trying to evaluate. I can ask you to find the base 2 log of 16 or the base 5 log of 25 or the base say, 2 log of 1 8 that sort of stuff. This would be good practice getting ready. All right, but that's it for me for today. So you guys clearly have enough on your plates right now. Go ahead and finish up the homework and quiz um, from Tuesday. This stuff, I will extend that through to next Tuesday for you. And then I'll also open up homework 17 and quiz 17, but I won't set those to be due until next Thursday. So we have a little bit of time to play together on Tuesday before you have to have that, have that complete. Um, I also have an activity for us on logarithms, just introducing logarithms. So be aware that next Tuesday we're going to do a little activity. And that is it from you guys. So I will see you next time.